Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar Talks. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Si Shang, a tobacco researcher at Ohio State University. TOPS is organized by myself, Justin White from the University of California, San Francisco, Mike Pasco from Georgia State University, and Catherine McLean from George Mason University. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Catherine McLean from George Mason University to introduce our speaker. Today, we continue our uh, spring 2022 season with a grounds rounds presentation by Hai Wen entitled Evaluation of Canadian E-Cigarette Policies. This presentation was selected via a competitive review process by submission through the TOPS website. Dr. Wen is a, an associate professor at Memorial University of Newfoundland, Canada. He specializes in health policy evaluation using quasi-experimental methods and large survey and administrative data. He has published several papers on Canadian public policies in substance use, tobacco, electronic cigarettes, and cannabis in leading health economics, public health, and medical journal journals. His policy research was funded by a Canada Research Chair Tier 2 in Health Policy Evaluation, a Fulbright Research Chair Award, and several grants by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. Our discussant today is Dr. Mike Pascoe from Georgia State University. Dr. Wynn, thank you so much for presenting today. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine, for the kind introduction. And, um, and thank you for this opportunity to uh, present my work. Uh, do you guys see my slides? I'm not quite yet. Can you see my slides now? Looks great. Great. Um, so again, thank you for the opportunity to present uh, my uh, research. Um, so in today's presentation, I will talk about uh, some findings uh, of my research uh, on um, some Canadian uh, vaping policy. So uh, this, uh, I want to acknowledge uh, the funding support from Canadian Institute of Health Research and Canada Research Program. I have no conflict of interest in uh, this work. I try work with uh, my postdoc, uh, Sweet Time Bita. So I, I would like to begin by uh, a brief overview of uh, what policy has been implemented and, and when in Canada. So electronic cigarettes uh, entered Canadian market in 2009. And between 2015 and 2017, uh, several uh, Canadian provinces uh, imposed um, the minimum legal sales aid uh, and also banned uh, vaping in public place. So minimum legal sales aid, uh, at the, as the name suggests, uh, banned the sales of electronic cigarettes to children under a certain age. <clears throat> so during this time period, some uh, provinces also uh, have restrictions on advertising. And uh, from 2018, the, min the minimum legal sale age uh, become uh, effective uh, nationwide. And 2019, uh, the uh, there's a federal ban on advertising. Um, so despite these uh, early uh, policies, uh, the vaping, uh, especially among youth, uh, continue to grow uh, dramatically. So in response, a province and uh, federal uh, government adopt additional policy so this policy including the ban on flavor inside electronic cigarettes, uh, there are cap on nicotine uh, content in electronic cigarettes. Uh, some province also impose a tax on on uh, electronic cigarette product. 
and um, in 2020, uh, Prince Edward Island uh, also raised uh, the minimum legal sales age uh, from 18 to 21. Uh, so just for comparison, I also show you the timeline of the policies in the U.S. And it seems to me that um, the um, the U.S. also follow uh, also have a similar sort of timelines of the policy. It started with uh, with uh, minimum legal uh, sales age and uh, the ban on on weapon and public place. Um, and some states uh, introduced uh, the tax as early as 2010. And uh, because of the weapon amount you continue to increase, so they uh, adopt uh, further policy. Um, so I, I, I think that the main difference between the US and Canada is that um, US seems to adopt this policy earlier, like three to four years earlier than Canada. And that probably because electronic cigarettes enter the market uh, in the US earlier uh, than Canada. So, uh, so this is the um, oh sorry. So the focus of the of today talk is on uh, the minimum legal sales age um, and the nicotine caps and the flavor ban. So I divided my talk into three sections. In the first section, I'm going to talk about the effects of uh, minimum legal sales age on the youth mental health, and uh, the purpose of this analysis is to in uh, to inform. Uh, the debate on the effects of vaping on uh, youth mental health. In the second section, <clears throat> I will continue to look at uh, minimum legal sales age and I look at the effects of these policies on convertible secret use. And uh, the motivation is try to inform the the current debate on whether electronic secrets uh, are substitutes or complement to convertible secrets. And finally, um, I will present some, uh, some uh, preliminary evidence on the effects of the flavor ban and nicotine caps on electronic secret use and convertible secret use. Uh, so you can see um, a limitation of uh, this uh, analysis is that I, I, will, I can only uh, show you the evidence of the effect of the combined of the combined effect of flavor ban and nicotine caps. I cannot separate the effect of these two policies and I will explain why along the way. So this is the first study. <clears throat> so just as a background, there's a huge interest and uh, there's a, and a debate on um, the heavy heavy effects of vaping, uh, especially uh, in terms of the mental health. So uh, the clinical and the public health literature um, has pointed to um, a number of ways where vaping uh, affect the mental health. So as you know, electronic cigarettes include nicotine, and nicotine is not good for for, for children uh, when their brain is still growing. Electronic cigarettes also include um, propylene, uh, glyco, uh, chemical uh, flavor compounds, and uh, metal uh, and heavy metal that um, that, don't, that don't have a neurotoxic uh, effects. And we know that uh, young people uh, use. Um, electronic cigarettes to discreetly uh, consume uh, cannabis and other illicit drugs and these drugs are also not, are also, uh, not good for the mental health. And it's also possible that uh, because electronic cigarettes become increasingly popular, there is a peer pressure on, uh, on other kids to consume, uh, to, to, to start vaping even though they don't want to. So, so this kind of peer pressure you uh, can also affect their, their mental health. <clears throat> So there are a lot of literatures, um, especially in the medical and public health, uh, that look at the effects of vaping on mental health. And uh, a recent uh, systematic review uh, of 40 studies uh, found that electronic cigarettes are associated with several mental disorders. However, the critics uh, argue that uh, well, this just association, um, they say they're not a causal uh, <coughs> relationship. It's, it's, um, it's possible that um, vaping can affect uh, the mental health, but at the same time, it can work the other way around. The people with um, with, with with mental health problem can start uh, uh, vaping, and there are also the issues of unobserved characteristics or several risk attitude can affect both uh, electronic cigarette use and mental disorder. So, in this study, um, I tried to use uh, 
the minimum the minimum legal sales is a, a source of exhaustion of variations in in vapin to uh, to shed light on uh, the cost or effects of electronic cigarette use on mental health. <clears throat> so I talked about uh, this uh, policy earlier, but here I will give you more details of the time life of this policy. So Nova Scotia adopted minimum legal sales age uh, in. 31st May 2015, so that's the first province. And then over the next two years, there are six more provinces adopted policy. So, and then uh, in May 2018, uh, the policy become effective uh, at the federal level. So, um, and so I'm, I'm going to look at the, stu uh, the study period up to 2018. So that means I have seven provinces that adopted the policy and three provinces uh, did not. And the minimum legal age is, is set uh, 19 or 18 depends on the on the province. So I estimate uh, the traditional uh, different indifference. Um, and uh, in addition, I also uh, estimate uh, a triple difference, and I include individual level and some uh, provincial level control such as secret price and provincial mental ban. I include the provincial mental ban because um, this ban. Uh, can affect um so 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 what this band does is, is to take the mental flavor from compatible secrets and this can uh, induce people to switch to uh, electronic secrets uh with uh, for which there's no ban on the on the mental flavor um so whenever you do a policy evaluation in Canada you always have faced the issues of a small number of cluster and, and so to deal with that we use the um the method by Carter and Carlis uh, it's called uh effective number of cluster uh, for inference. Uh, specifically, we use the distribution with uh, G, G minus one, or G star minus one, with G star is the effective number of cluster. So we look at two main outcomes here, mood disorder, anxiety disorder. Uh, please know that these are the self-reported um, outcome. This is not from admin uh, data. We use uh, the most comprehensive uh, Health survey uh, in Canada, which is Canadian Community Health Survey. This is annual survey and it interview uh, people uh, uh, monthly. Uh, so we look at the uh, we, we we look at the example fifteen to uh, minimum legal age uh, when we do the different the different, and we for the triple for the triple different analysis we look at the, the age from fifteen to uh, twenty four, and as I mentioned earlier, we look at um, the, the study period uh, ended May 2018, uh, which is before the, the federal uh, ban because the recent literature uh, on different, in different suggest that we should not include uh, the periods where all the, uh, all the group has been treated because that will generate issues uh, with the negative weight. So this figure show uh, the trend over time for these two outcomes. Uh, on the left, smooth disorder, on the, on the right side, anxiety disorder. Um, the vertical, the, the, the first vertical uh, lies at the time period of the policy. Uh, at the provincial level, the, um, the dotted, uh, the last vertical lies in the federal uh, ban. And uh, the, the dust uh, lies uh, is for the, uh, represent the province without the policy and the solid life of the province with the policy. So as you can see, um, the mood disorder, uh, the prevalent mood disorder is so going up over time. However, during the time period uh, of the policy implementation, you see that the mood disorder going down for the province with the policy and continue to go up for the province. Uh, without the policy, and after uh, the the federal ban, they sort of follow uh, in a si similar path. For anxiety disorder, we, we can see the similar pattern. They track each other quite closely, and during the time uh, uh, periods of uh, adopting uh, the minimum legal sale age, uh, we see that there's uh, they travel in in in, in opposite direction. And then uh, after the policy, the federal policy, we see, we see that they they go parallel. There's the one uh, one exception here, where in, in 2018, you see that um, there is a decline in the province 
without a policy and increase in the province uh, with the policy, but, but that is the only uh, uh, exception. So, um, so this graph seems to suggest that um, the prevalence of mood disorder and anxiety disorder going down uh, following the adoption of the minimum legal uh, sales age. So here uh, are the main uh, results. So on the top panel, I the different different analysis uh, estimates, and then the bottom is the triple difference. The first column is for mood disorder, and second column for anxiety disorder. You see that uh, the electronic cigarette, uh, uh, the minimum legal sales age is um, associated with two percentage point reduction in mood disorder. Uh, the estimates for anxiety. Uh, the policy effect for anxiety disorder also negative, but it's not uh, significant. When we, when we uh, use uh, in the triple different analysis, you see that the, the coefficient is uh, is quite similar in terms of magnitude. It's negative and it's, it's significant, two point two uh, reduction uh, uh, in percentage point for mood disorder, and now the coefficients for anxiety disorder become significant. Um, and the mandatory is 2.8 uh, percentage point reduction in the risk of anxiety disorder. <clears throat> uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the main purpose of, of, of this analysis is to, 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 to estimate the cause and effect of vaping on uh, mental health. So uh, to do that, I, I just combine the, um, the estimate of the policy effects uh, for um, for mental health with the uh, with the estimate from the first stage estimation where we estimate the effects of uh, this policy on electronic secret use and this already published in in, in, in another paper earlier so uh, to to, uh, to explain what it means here the minimum legal sales uh, law uh, reduced the electronic secret use by 4.3 percentage point. And when we combine this with the with the estimate with the reduction in the risk of mood disorder and anxiety disorder, then we get the implied effects of uh, implied causal effects of vaping on mood disorder and uh, for anxiety disorder specifically. Uh, this uh, this number means that um, the use of electronic cigarettes are uh, associated with forty seven percent more likely. Uh, to have a uh, mood disorder and 28% more likely uh, to have uh, anxiety disorder. I talked uh, in the early slides about different uh, potential uh, mechanism uh, through which uh, vaping can affect mental health. So I, 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 I want to uh, explore that uh, those channel in, in this analysis here. So this slide shows you the effects of a minimum legal sales age law on different outcomes. And specifically, uh, we look at the part 12 month cannabis use, part 12 month elect, elect, uh, illicit drug use. Uh, for, in terms of the PLC facts, we look at, uh, we, we explore the information on uh, whether you feel close to people at school, whether you feel being part of school, whether you feel safe at school. And the result indicates that um, the minimum legal uh, sales age uh, reduced uh, the propensity uh, of using ca cannabis use by 6% point and reduce uh, the risk of illicit drug use by 3.9% point. And the, the coefficient for the PSA effect are positive, but only significant for feeling uh, part of the school. And, and what it means here is that the electronic secret uh, minimum legal sales age uh, in, uh, increase uh, the propensity of, of feeling uh, being part of school by 2.1 percentage point. <clears throat> uh, some event study, uh, and it's, it seems that I don't have you know, the issue of uh, parallel train, uh, the, the issues of, of the different in, par in, in parallel train. So, so that looks okay. Um, so, so far, um, I only use the traditional uh, two-way fixed effects uh, to estimate the effect of, of this policy. And uh, and the recent li literature uh, in uh, different, different uh, so that in the context of stacker policy implementation and uh, heterogeneous uh, treatment effect, um, the effects of the policy uh, that uh, estimated by the two-way 
uh, fixed effect can be uh, biased. And the root cause for that is that uh, the treatment, uh, the two way fixed effect model, it includes uh, not just the good comparison that used um, the never treated and not yet treated as control, but it also includes the bad comparison that uh, used uh, uh, the early treated as the control. And in the context of, of uh, so, so when, when we include this bad comparison, we're going to get the negative weight. And this negative weight, in the context of homogeneous treatment effect, there's, there would be no problem, but in the context of heterogeneous, uh, heterogeneous treatment effect, the negative way can translate into bias in the estimate. So um, I want to test uh, whether uh, the uh, homogeneous treatment effect assumption underlying the two way fit effects uh, is satisfied or not. So for that, I use a simple test uh, proposed by Jaquila in her working paper 2021. Um, so her idea is it this. So uh, if there is a homogeneous uh, treatment effect, then we're going to see the linear relationship between the residual outcome and the residual and residual treatment uh, after removing the, the fixed effect. So to, so to obtain the residual outcome, I just um, uh, regress the outcome on the fixed effect and take the difference between the actual outcome and the predicted outcome. And similarly, to obtain visualized treatment, I regress the treatment on the fixed effect and then take the difference between the the treatment and the predicted and the predicted treatment. So as you can see here, the linear I uh, would see the linear relationship between the visualized outcome and visualized treatment. <clears throat> and this uh, and, and the slope of this linear relationship is similar between the treatment observation and and comparison observation. So we suggest that um, uh, uh, the assumption of homogeneous treatment effect seems to be appropriate uh, in this uh, context. Um, it, even though uh, we see to, to 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 be good in terms of the uh, homogeneous Genial treatment effect as due to the vacant decomposition, uh, and as you can see here, the bad uh, the bad uh, types of comparison is in the is in the middle rows here, with highlights in the red color, and this uh, bad comparison uh, only account for six percent of all comparison that used in the in the two ways fixed effect. Um, I also do. I also use one of the recommended method to deal with um, uh, potential heterogeneous, uh, heterogeneous treatment effects, and this method is, is, is proposed by Bousiat and and, and Carlis. It's called. Uh, it is often referred to as the imputation method, and the reason for that is this method uh, uh, impute the character uh, factor outcome using uh, the observation uh, from the never treated and. Uh, and not yet treated observations, and then detect the difference between the counterfactual uh, outcome and actual outcome to obtain the effect of the policy. And when I use this method, I, I, I obtain very similar result here, where Moody's shorter is, is um, negative uh, electronic secret law, uh, reduce the Moody's shorter risk and anxiety risk. Um, and this result should not be surprising because in the context of a more genial treatment effect, uh, these two methods should give you a uh, similar result. So I will stop here to take any questions that you might have for me. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Wen. This is really fascinating work. Uh, we have some questions from the audience, but I think we'll give our discussant, Dr. Mike Esco, uh, some time to ask some questions. Hey, I th I thank you. Yes, uh, very interesting uh, a presentation. Um, I'll, I'll start off with one thing I really like, um, uh, just, you know, the idea of using the minimum legal sales age law variation as a source of exogenous variation for vaping uh, to overcome some of the self-selection concerns. Um, you really set that up nice, and I think that I think that that's a, a great idea as a way to provide, you know, some reliable estimates on um, what we think the effect of e-cigarette use is on, on, on some of these health outcomes. Um, so that's really nice. Um, one question. Uh, so um, you find a what looks to me to be a pretty reasonable kind of first stage 
uh, effect of about a 4.3 percentage point reduction in e-cigarette use as a result of the e-cigarette MLSA. So that that makes sense to me. Um, so you have the if go back to just the slides that you had. Um, so you have uh, go back to your your first set of results slides with the DD models, if you would. Oh, okay. Well, it's basically you have 8,000 observations um, that form that estimate. Um, and then with the, the mental health disorders, you have about 31,000 uh, observations. So I was wondering why there's the differences in, um, in sample sizes. Uh, this one, right? Yeah. Uh, we have a different sample size because we use a different uh, survey. Right? So for this, um, for the effects of the laws on electronic secret use, we use uh, the uh, data from CTOMS and CTAS. Mm -hmm. So they have a smaller uh, sample size. Okay. And for, for, for the two study, we use data from Canadian Committee Health Survey. They have a larger sample size. Okay. And then for and then on the next slide, you have about 160 140,000 observations for the um, like the, the cannabis use and illicit drug use uh, outcomes. Is that a, a third data source then as well? Oh yeah, so 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 this is uh, also the CTOMS uh, data set, and this can allow uh, that when and these data go back in time, so we have more uh, observations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's, we do what we can with limited data. Ideally, we have e-cigarette use in all of these surveys and everything. So, um, so that makes sense. Uh, I mean, I, ideally, we have kind of the same <laughs> outcomes from the same from the same survey to permit kind of more easy more easy uh, a comparison. But um, but sometimes we're faced with data limitations. Yeah, I, I I totally agree with you. In, in, in this context, the Canadian Committee Health Survey only. Uh, Ask the question about electronic cigarettes from 2015, which is sort of two reasons. So I don't have a lot of data uh, for the pre period. However, um, to make sure that uh, one of the conditions for using the two sample instrumental variable here is, is that the, the study population has to be similar uh, across two, uh, two surveys that we, that, that we use. So as a result, we make sure that we only look at the same study population, which is from 15 to to, to under minimum legal age. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And then, you know, the other kind of curious thing um, about, about the results is just the huge effect on cannabis and illicit drug use on, on your next slide, right? So, I mean, we see a, a 4.8 percentage point reduction in uh, what I assume is nicotine e-cigarette use, although I'd be curious to hear more about how that question is, is worded. Um, and then we see a six percentage point reduction in uh, cannabis use. So to me, it's kind of surprising that we see larger effects on um, what I think is a product that isn't um, isn't the one being regulated, right? Um, and I was just curious if you have any any thoughts on why why those effects could be could be larger. Yeah, that's a great question. I thought I guess that um, the reason for this is that can, even though cannabis uh, at that time, I mean, before 2018, this is the illegal product, but cannabis is, is widely used in Canada by kids, by young people, and the average age that they start using cannabis in Canada is 15 years old. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, we, we, we have uh, electronic cigarettes use starting from like 2010, 2012, something like that, but cannabis go back in time and Canada is now as, as one of the country with the highest prevalence of cannabis use mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the world, especially for the young kids. So, so I don't have uh, the pre-policy prevalence of cannabis use, but I suspect that that is quite high. So, so, so this number is, is high because of uh, the, the high prevalence of cannabis use. Mm -hmm. um, I I yeah. Right, yeah. right. Um, and, and there were, um, do you know if there were any other kind of concurrent policies that were uh, enacted in the uh, in the, the Canada provinces at the same time that they passed the e-cigarette minimum legal sales tax? Yeah, that yeah. Specifically that, affected cannabis use. That that is the great question. And um, as you see here, we have a public place a vapid ban, ban almost at the same time, right? Mm. So. So this is uh, so to address this, and this is the, one of the reasons I use the trip difference because uh, this uh, 
depend on the public uh, play uh, uh, affect both the kids under the minimum legal age as well the kids just above minimum legal age so when i do the triple different so the effects of the ban on uh, on public display vaping sort of, sort of will be removed uh, in the triple uh, different analysis and i also have a separate paper where i look at the effects of the ban on the vaping in public displays and what i, I found is there's no effect uh, anyway so um so so sort of those, those are the two things that can help to mitigate concern about the confounding effects of uh of the ban on public display all right thanks Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, just uh, one quick question from our audience, uh, Dr. Wen, and then I think we'll have to move along in the absence of time. Um, I guess is, there's a question from Norbert uh, Schmidt about whether or not there might be any curiosity effects um, of using e-cigarettes uh, and if that is incorporated into your analysis. So curiosities of uh, yes, the, that the, um, the youth might be curious about these products uh, due to sort of advertising from the United States or some other factor. Okay. Yeah, so so I, I agree that there must, uh, some of the webbing uh, would originate from curiosity. Uh, however, be, because we use so we do different different uh, analysis and triple different. So the level of um, the share of of, of people who 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 use electronic cigarette out of uh, curiosity uh, is likely to be similar across the province. And when when we do the triple uh, different different analysis, so 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 this kinds of uh, curiosity uh, of vaping, uh should be cancelled out. And so so I don't think uh, that uh, affect uh, the um, the estimate of biasness. Thank you very much. Um, I get, we'll, uh, we'll save the rest of the questions to later. We've got about a half an hour left, but please continue with this really wonderful presentation. So uh, in this uh, analysis, I'm looking at the effects of minimum legal cigarettes on youth smoking. So just some uh, background, you probably know that um, the uh, smoking prevalence has, has, uh, among you has uh, been declining steadily over the years. And at the same time, there is a dramatic rise in um, vaping, uh, especially in, in, uh, in the past um, six, eight years. So that raised the question um, whether electronic cigarette uh, rise has anything to do uh, in uh, driving uh, in, 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 in the decline in, uh, in the smoking prevalence. Uh, so there's a, a huge debate on this. Uh, one side of debate saying that no, um, the, um, the decline in the smoking prevalence already started several, uh, two decades ago. So uh, electronic cigarettes right, has nothing to do with this. And uh, and they they uh, and these are the people who oppose electronic cigarettes. They even argue that look, electronic cigarette can be even a gateway into uh, a smoking. But then the other side of uh, of the debate say that uh, yeah, we agree that um, the, it, the the smoking prevalence already declined uh, a long time ago. However, the decline of the smoking prevalence become larger in recent years, which may have something to do with the rise in electronic cigarettes. And they also argue again the gateway hypothesis. They said that if um, electronic cigarette is a gateway, we should have we should have seen an increase in the smoking prevalence, which is not the case. Uh, so that is uh, uh, the debate about this. And, and, and this debate essentially is about whether uh, electronic cigarettes are complement or substitute uh, to uh, convertible cigarettes. So uh, there's existing literature that would use the minimum legal uh, sales age law uh, to set lights on this issue. Uh, some early study uh, used aggregate state level data and they found that electronic secret uh, law, uh, electronic secret minimum legal sales age law increased the secret use, which implied a substitution. Uh, however, some later study used individual level data and they found the mixed result. Some study find in, increase in, in, in secret use and some study find reduction in the secret use. So it is in this context that uh, uh, we do this analysis to try to uh, to add some evidence uh, from the Canadian um, data. And I want to know here that uh, there also another literature that look at the um, the uh, that use the secrets and uh, electronic secrets price and text 
as an exhaustion and another exhaustion source of variation in vaping. So this literature also inform the question whether electronic cigarette and, and, and cigarette are compulsory uh, uh, a complement a substitute. But uh, because of the time constraint, I will not go into detail in this uh, literature. So uh, our study has uh, some distinct features from uh, the exist existing study uh, in the U.S. So uh, the first feature is that uh, we look at not just the smoking participation, but also we go beyond that. We look at the smoking initiation and the smoking sensation outcome. And if you think about it, the smoking participation, uh, any change in smoking uh, participation can be seen as the, as the net outcome of the change in the smoking initiation and the smoking sensation, right? So there's a, there's a, that the entry and exit and, and the combination of entry and exit is going to determine the change in smoking participation. And as it turns out, that I will show you in the later slide, it, it's important to look at this smoking initiation and smoking sensation so that we can understand what drives the change in the smoking participation outcome. And another advantage that we have is that we, we it, uh, our Canadian data seem to have um, good uh, information on um, on the survey uh, month uh, informa uh, uh, information. So that allow us to do a more accurate coding of policy exposure. Um, so, so just a little bit more in information about uh, the outcome for smoking participation. We look at every secret use and current secret use for smoking initiation. Uh, we define it as the part term on smoking initiation. We also distinguish between uh, the initiation into regular smoking or initiation into experimental smoking. And experiment, experimental smoking is defined as someone who smoked less than 100 cigarettes during his lifetime. And for smoking sensation, we look at a part 12 month of smoking sensation. <clears throat> so this uh, figure shows you the trend in compatible cigarette use over time for these two outcomes. The setup was, uh, is similar as before. Uh, the, the dotted uh, line uh, dropping without uh, the policy and, and, and the solid line dropping with the policy. And you can see that um, the smoking barrel is uh, trending uh, downward uh, uh, over time. And it's seen that they, they track each other uh, very closely between the province with and without the policy. And uh, it seems to me that there's, there's, uh, there's, there's no evidence of the difference in the, in the convertible secret use uh, after the policy. And here is the result, uh, and this result confirm uh, the graphical evidence. We don't see any evidence uh, of, uh, of the effects of electronic secret uh, minimum legal sales age on, uh, on, uh, on the secret use outcome. And this result are consistent between the, uh, the, the, the different difference as well as the triple difference. Uh, so this table shows you the result uh, for smoking initiation and sensation, and, and it's just interesting to do to see that it turns out that the the law, the law reduced uh, a smoking initiation by two point six percentage point, and this uh, reduction in smoking initiation is driven by uh, a reduction in the smoking experimentation. And we also look at the result for the two age group, 15 to 16 and 17 to 18. And the reason we do this is because we, we, we suspect that those uh, who age are closer to minimum uh, sales age might be more likely to be affected by, by, by this policy. And, 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 and it turns out to be the case. You see that um, the, the policy reduced uh, the smoking initiation by 4.2 percentage point for, for youth age 18 to 17, but there's no effect. Uh, it's not significant effect for for the young age. And again, the, the reduction in smoking initiation is uh, driven mostly by reduction in, in those who, who want to experiment with, uh, uh, with smoking. Uh, interestingly, when uh, for the result for the smoking sens sensation, we see that <coughs> There's a reduction here, although it's not significant. Uh, when we look at the full sample, when we break it into a 15, uh, 16 versus a 17, 18, you see that there's a larger effect, uh, larger reduction for the a 17, 18. This is not, uh, this estimate is imprecisely um, estimated, uh, probably because of, of, of a small sample size. Uh, but however, it seems it seems to 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 point to the story that uh, this policy has no effect on the smoking prevalence in general. However, 
this no effect mask uh, a reduction in uh, the smoking initiation and a reduction in the smoking sensations. And the result of from the triple different uh, or to the similar pattern, we see that uh, we see a reduction in the for, for the age group, uh, for the older age group, uh, 17 to 18, and the, and the coefficient for the smoking sensation are even larger, although it is still not uh, very, very, uh, significant. Uh, due to event studies, and we don't seem to have the issue with uh, with the violation of the parallel trend. Uh, we did uh, uh, for bacon uh, the the back comparison accounts only for one percent, <clears throat> and we also do um, another check where we use the Callaway and San Ana, and it seems that we get similar uh, result here, where we see a reduction in um, in smoking initiation for the age seventeen to eighteen, and uh, we don't see uh, and we get some evidence of the reduction in smoking sensation. And now it's become even significant uh, for uh, uh, for the age 17, 18. All right, so that's what I have for the second uh, study. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Wen. Um, uh, Mike Pesco, do you have any questions for uh, for our presenter? Yeah, um, would you mind going back to the first uh, set of results? Okay, right here. Yeah, thank you for this. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, my understanding of the um, uh, of the the, the DD uh, literature, I think that there are um, there are five studies that have used a, a difference in difference analysis to study the effects of these minimum legal cell stage laws in the United States, which you know, very different context. There's reason to think that the laws might operate differently in the United States versus Canada, right? Um, uh, but I think uh, the studies, they generally look at current cigarette use, right? And, and so I think that's your 0 0.004 estimate right here. So suggesting that there is a statistically insignificant 0 0.4 percentage point increase in uh, current cigarette use as a result of the minimum legal cell stage that that falls like smack in the middle, basically of um, you know of the other estimates. So that that part of it looks pretty similar uh, to me to to the other literature. Um, and then when you break it down on the next slide, um, if you wouldn't mind going one more, right? This is where we. This is interesting, right? Because uh, you're you're showing some uh, different kind of margins of smoking, and this hasn't been done before, so that's really interesting. Um, what I do notice, though, is that so you have 46,000 uh, observations for the current <coughs> cigarette use earlier, right? And now when we break or the current cigarette use, but now when we break it down by the different smoking types here, um, we seem to have about 41,000. So who who are the 5,000 people that don't show up uh, in the, the stratified uh, results on, on this? So... Uh... The way we we uh, we define the smoking initiation outcome is that uh, we the denominator uh, the the sample include the people who never smoke and the people who initiate uh, smoking within the past ten months. So this is a smaller sample compared with the full sample. Mm -hmm. Well, I um, so I think that the maybe the missing five thousand people they are. Um, people that are continuing to quit that don't try, or the people that are continuing to smoke that don't try smoking cessation? Yeah, that's probably the case. Uh, perhaps we, 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 we should do a robotic check where we include those people as well. Yeah, just as an extra column, yeah, right? Because yeah, I, yeah, I, sure. sus I, agree. I suspect that you would see them because you have that, <coughs> that positive coefficient in the earlier slide, right? And now we have two yep. big negative coefficients. I think that yep. that missing group of people, there's going to be a yep. large, large positive, yep. um, large positive. Yeah, that's a good idea. Thanks. Okay. Um, and I think that, that that was my main, the uh, main comment that I had. Oh, and then I guess one small comment, and I know an audience <laughs> member had this was just the standard, some cases, the standard errors, right, are larger than the, the, um, the coefficient, uh, like with, you know, these results here, right? Oh, um, okay. Any any reason for that? Uh, probably that we have very small sample size here, so it's just very imprecise estimated. But but I I I take the comment. And I I will double check it. Okay. Thanks. 
Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Pascal. Uh, Dr. Wing, just a couple of quick questions about your first paper. Just I'll summarize them. Uh, there was a question uh, from Skip Murray asking uh, about the, the mental health measures. Are these self-reports or are they a clinical diagnosis? I think maybe you indicated that was a survey response. And yes, then, yes. Uh, so, 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 the, so this outcome has self-reported, although I believe that uh, the, the question sort of asked them to self-report the, their condition that diagnosed by clinicians. Great, thank you. And then uh, Alan Matthews has just a, a suggestion about a potential <coughs> anti-test would be to run the analysis on those 21 to 24 years old to, to see whether you see effects in that sample where you might not uh, expect it. That seems oh, like a very helpful yeah, comment. Yeah, so yeah, 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 that's a that's a great suggestion. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Um, and then we'll we'll continue on. Uh, we just have about four uh, about 15 minutes left. So thanks so much. Okay, so uh, in this study, I look at uh, the effects of uh, the flavor band and nicotine cap uh, for electronic cigarettes. So just as a, a brief uh, background, so the flavor, uh, so Nova Scotia is the first Canadian province to adopt this policy in twenty in April twenty twenty, and in um, in September twenty uh, twenty twenty, uh, British Columbia adopted this flavor ban for for nicotine cap. Both Nova Scotia and British Columbia adopted at the same time. <coughs> after uh, after that, all the province uh, started to adopt this flavor ban. 2021, and these two policies now have, have, uh, have become effective uh, at the federal level. Uh, so this uh, policy uh, main objective is to protect children from electronic cigarettes. Um, however, there's a lot of debates on this. Uh, people argue that, well, this policy can switch children from vaping into uh, compatible cigarette use, which is even more harmful. Uh, if you cut uh, uh, the access into uh, fl flavor uh, electronic cigarettes that can lead to a lower sen uh, smoking sensation because a lot of people use electronic cigarettes to quit smoking. And this policy will might, might also uh, promote uh, the black market for flavor electronic cigarettes. So uh, there's a big debate on this. Um, and, uh, in terms of the existing study, that um, I'm aware of two studies at the moment. Uh, so the first one is, is by Friedman. Uh, published in uh, JAMA Pediatrics, I believe. Uh, she looked at um, a flavor band uh, in a state in the US, and then she found that the flavor band lead to uh, lower combustible cigarette use. No, actually, I, I think this is, uh, this is from, this, this study found that this flavor band lead to higher combustible cigarette use. So there she found the evidence of the substitution uh, uh, to compatible secret use in response to this band. And the more recent study, Ali that uh, look at the flavor band in, uh, adopted in four states in the US, and they find that, that this band, uh, a flavor band, lead to uh, a lower uh, sales, uh, reduced electronic secret sales. So this study look at uh, flavor band only. Uh, so in, in my context, uh, and given the limitation of the data, I, I look at the effects of, the combined effect of these two policies together. <clears throat> so I, I used the similar data for the compatible secrets earlier, and I, I, I add a two, uh, uh, two more, uh, two cycle, two recent cycle uh, of the survey for 2019 and 2020. Uh, and this survey name is, is, is uh, Canadian Tobacco Negative Survey. They actually the same survey as, as earlier year. It just had a, a different name. But the major change and actually the limitation is that the two survey in 2019 and 2020 only uh, conducted for two uh, for two final months of the year. So what it means is that in most uh, of the 2020, I have no data. Therefore, uh, because the, the the policy adopted one in April 2020 and September 2020, I have no data to to separate the effect of the two policy. I look at the two outcome. Um, the part of the electronic secret use and, and part of the secret use. And um, because this topic focus on the youth, uh, the impact on the youth, so, so I look at um, the effect on the youth age 15 to 19 and age 20 to 24. And the reason I break into two uh, age group because the, the young age group uh, sort of subject to a different kinds of legislation 
uh, environment, which is uh, the minimum legal sales A. So that's why I, I separate it into two different age groups. <coughs> um, just uh, if you show you sort of the trend uh, in this outcome uh, for the two age group, uh, you see that this um, the uh, the weapon prevalence increased over time, uh, but between 2019 2020, um, there is a, a, a decline in both uh, Nova Scotia and, and Control Province. However, the, the, the reduction in Nova Scotia is, is larger than uh, in the Control Province. Uh, in terms of the compatible secret use, you see that uh, there's a downward trend again, um, and it's, it's similar. <coughs> Between the Nova Scotia and Coin Control Province, and in particular, uh, before and after the the, the, the policy, uh, it seems that there's there's no difference uh, in the change in in the compatible secret view between uh, between the Nova Scotia and Control Province, and for the eight uh, twenty to twenty four, we have a similar trend going up upward uh, for uh, for the two uh, versus control, and there seems to be a larger re reduction. <coughs> In the treated body control. Uh, so similarly, um, so uh, for for compatible secret, you you see that they track each other, and there's no difference in the in the change uh, between uh, control and treated treated group. So um, this uh, graphical uh, uh, so 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 the figures seems to suggest that there's appear to be uh, reductions in in vaping. Uh, in the in the West Coast, so relative to the province without <coughs> without the policy, uh, when there's no effect on the compatible secrets. <coughs> For British Columbia, we have a similar uh, graph here. The similar path is increased. Uh, for webbing is increased over time, and then it's going down for both treated and control until the the decline in the treated. Uh, province is larger. <coughs> for uh, a 20 to 24. <coughs> Sorry. However, there's no, uh, there's no more difference in terms of uh, the, the, uh, the vaping uh, prevalence. They go down uh, in both uh, EC and control province, the same amount. Uh, for, uh, for the um, smoking prevalence, there's no evidence here uh, that it indicates there is an effect or effects on, on compatible secret use <coughs> for the eight, 18 to 19. <coughs> oh, uh, Dr. Wen, uh, pardon me. Um, maybe if we could just try and um, leave a few minutes at the end for questions. I know okay. there's a lot of people who yeah, want to have sure. some comments. Thank you. <coughs> so how much more time do I have? Uh, if you could maybe <coughs> wrap up in maybe about, say, five minutes, I think that would be great. Thank you. I think I, I'm almost there. Um, so, so the the um, the one one thing I want to know here is that this uh, this graph uh, that show the trend for compatible secret use for A twenty to twenty four for British Columbia does it seem to satisfy the parallel trend? So, if you look at this from two thousand four to two thousand thirteen, they all going down, but between two thousand thirteen to two thousand nineteen here, it, it it go flat, it go horizontal for BC, but it going down for uh, uh, for the control province and uh, and and so so the parallel trend is, it seems not uh, seems to be violated in here and 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 this is going to be translated into a, a quite noisy result and I will show you in the next uh, slide. So 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 here the result from uh, the, the the different different analysis. You see that there is um, a reduction in um, in the uh, vaping prevalence uh, for the age 18 to 19 uh, uh, in. Nova Scotia, and also the a lot different, uh, the large reduction, although it's not significant for British Columbia for the A15 to 19. There's no effect uh, on the A20 to 24 uh, in terms of the vaping. Uh, in terms of uh, the compatible secret use, uh, the result indicates that there's some reduction here for the A15 to 19 Nova Scotia. Uh, no effects for A20 to 24. Uh, the result for BC uh, uh, indicates no effect for A. To 19, but uh, but this one is a little bit uh, um, noisy here. You see that the uh, the, the, the policy increased the uh, compatible secret use by 6.7 percentage uh, points for the A20 to 24, and, and, and this uh, probably because uh, of this thing where this one go horizontal and this one going down. So 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 this so this unparalleled trend before the policy 
uh, translate into this uh, analysis uh, result. So I do some uh, robustly check, and uh, after uh, one robust check, I, I exclude the secret CPI and uh, the result uh, for uh, the reduction in uh, vaping for the A15 to 19 is still um, still there, and now it becomes significant for uh, for particular vaping as well, uh, because of the problem with the uh, with the uh, the parallel train in, in the class I showed earlier. So I, I try to con to to fix that using genetic control, and it turns out that uh, we don't have any genetic control results, so that there's no effect uh, at all for uh, compatible secret U for for the two H group. And I can I can do uh, genetic control only for the compatible secret U because uh, there's a long enough the free policy. Uh, a period, which is the condition for state control. So uh, to summarize, uh, I find that the minimum legal sale aid reduce the risk of mood and anxiety disorder. <coughs> so this suggests that uh, this law has uh, the benefit that go beyond reducing electronic secret use. And it also suggests that electronic secret use can contribute to the mental health crisis uh, among youth. <coughs> I find no evidence that uh, I, I find no effect of the minimum legal sale age on youth participation, but this no effects mark the reduction in the smoking initiation and, and lower smoking cessation. And what is meaning for uh, for the debate on whether this complement uh, substitute? So the answer is that it depends on the, the <coughs> depend on the status of of the smoker. So if you are never smoker, then this policy reduce the initiation and also reduce electronic cigarette, in which case it means that they are complement. But for existing smoker, this policy reduce the smoking sensation and at the same time reduce electronic cigarette use. So that means that these two products are substitute. And finally, the earlier the, the early evidence that I have seems to, seem to suggest that flavor ban and nicotine cap reduce electronic cigarette use among youth uh, among uh, young people under 18 and 19 years old uh, with no change in the compatible secret use. Thank you very much. So that's what I have. I hope I still have enough time to respond to question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nguyen. That was just fantastic. Um, Dr. Pesco, if you have a couple of questions, and then if anyone in the audience would like to add there, uh, please please add something to the Q&A. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, yeah, thank, thank, thanks, Hype, for a great presentation. Um, uh, would you mind going back to, to your re results again? Um, forward one. Great. Um, so uh, I know you're doing an admirable job uh, as you can uh, with the, you know, when kind of the data is collected, right? And when the policy variation happens, right? Um, could you could you just rem uh, remind me, why do we have 56,000 observations for cigarette use and 12,000 for e-cigarette use? Is it different different data sources again? or? Uh, no, this is the same data source, but it's just that uh, for the compatible secret view, it, I can go back in time. But for the electronic secret view, the, 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 the survey collected from 2013. So I that's, that explained the difference. Yeah. I see. I think, it, I, think, I think it would be uh, compelling to add then a column of results that keeps the time period consistent um, with what you have available for e-cigarette use for, uh, uh, for cigarette use to see if the, um, <clears throat> to see if the results are uh, 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 the, the same. Um, yep. And that's then- just, just a, Thank you. Okay, and then uh, and then it is the does the survey force you to use these gratifications of fifteen and nineteen, twenty to twenty four, or um, uh, is do you, uh, create those categories of ages yourself? No, this is uh, the the a category uh, in the survey. Okay, I see. I see. Okay, great. I'll, I'll turn it over to the uh, to uh, uh, Catherine and, and audience questions. Then thanks again. Thanks so much. I think we just have a one. It's a bit of a follow up on Mike's question uh, from <coughs> Sibylla Nelson. Uh, she's just uh, they're just wondering um, whether with these different sample sizes, how how comfortable can we be in comparing across the different the findings based on these different sample sizes? Um, yeah, so I, so I get I, uh, I think it's a good idea that I need to do the and another uh, I, I do one more analysis where i look at the same <coughs> the same study period uh, for both uh electronic secret use and both secret use uh, to, to to see whether the results uh, are consistent uh the main reason for our uh, for using a longer time period for compatible secret view is that we really want to go back in time and especially there's some issue with um with the parallel train and for that i want to use take control to to fix that and 
to be able to use state control, you need to have a long enough the free policy. So that is uh, the reason why I, I decided to do a lot of the time period for convertible secret. Great, thanks so but, much. Uh, and just going back a bit, uh, Francis Thompson a while ago had a question just about your prices. I think this was on an earlier pay, uh, an earlier study, uh, wondering if does the price data include the effect of contraband, which is uh, likely to be substantially larger in Ontario and Quebec than in say Alberta and Saskatchewan? Uh, I believe that these data do not reflect uh, the uh, the contraband because these data were collected by the government and this is official data uh, from the retail store. Uh, yeah, no, no uh, this, this is, I do not reflect that. Uh, so uh, I was wondering whether our analysis uh, uh, capture the um, effect of contraband in some way. I get we 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 captured that partially through the province fixed effect because we have a contraband issue in a certain province like Quebec, uh, Ontario. So, so so that should be sort of captured to some extent by the province fixed effects. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Doctor uh, Wynn. This was really fantastic. Thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, the opportunities and thank you for all your comments and feedback. Thank you. We are out of time. Thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant family. Thank you to the audience of 150 people for your participation. Have a top notch weekend. Bye. Bye bye.